Welcome to the One to One Podcast, brought to you by the Learning Technology Center of Illinois. The LTC is a program of the Illinois State Board of Education. We support all K-12 districts, schools, and educators in Illinois through technology initiatives, services, and professional learning opportunities. Our work addresses high-need technology and digital learning challenges. We help schools increase access to and use of technology to improve educational opportunities for students. Our hosts are Brian Bates, Associate Executive Director for Professional Learning, and Matt Jacobson, Online Learning Coordinator. Let's get started. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to the LTC one-to-one podcast. Um, Brian, how are you doing today? It's a little chilly in Illinois these days. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to thaw out. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> it's it's funny how warm 20 degrees feels when it has been minus 10. So, uh, you know, that's being happy that the temperature is above zero is uh is not something i always expect to say but but definitely happy we're above zero so it's it's all relative right yeah. yep uh, um well i a lot of schools uh here in western illinois and up where you are in northern illinois were out um earlier in the week and and some are out again today um uh this is middle of, of january and these things happen in illinois um I, I know that we all got a lot of time with our uh, learning from home uh, strategies back during COVID, and uh, many schools are leveraging uh, that uh, learning from home uh, experience during these cold winter days. So uh, a lot of schools up by you closed down this week? Yeah, earlier this week, we, uh, I think today we didn't have as quite as much snow, oddly enough, as you guys down south. Uh, Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, there's been a a lot of e-learning going on around me, um, seeing what the, you know, the schools are uh, calling remote learning or e-learning days last week. And then this week, Um, you know, uh, it's funny. And I think we, we had talked about this, uh, maybe last week or the week before uh, this podcast, we talked about how, uh, you know, in the the winter of 2019, there was a, a mad rush to submit the e-learning day plans because that was the oh, big yes, thing yeah. is we were going to do these e-learning days to avoid snow days. We're going to submit, you know, I know you worked with a lot of schools to help them kind of craft what that plan was going to look like. So then it could go onto the ROE to be approved. And that was like, we were full, full throttle on that in December of 2019 and then, you know, funny thing is we're prepping for one to two days, maybe in a row, possibly, hopefully no more than a few days per year. And then fast forward four months and we saw e-learning day go into like a uh, semi-permanent situation. Right. So uh, it just, right. it's funny to, it's funny here we are now having snow days going back to those e-learning day plans when it, it was such a huge deal, uh, you know, four years ago. So I, I just, right. I just think that's. It's funny how things come back around, you know. Perspective. Once again, it's all kind of relative, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> well, and and you bring up a good point. Um, and and sort of the, the focus of our, our podcast today is to sort of highlight um, some of the things that the LTC does and services that are offered. And a, I think a lot of people... Um, don't realize sometimes how much the LTC does. I mean, we're in the professional learning realm. We've got some folks in the, uh, Jared, Eric, and Dwayne are are in our tech services. Um, You might think uh, IT and tech department stuff is what they do. And that's what a lot of people kind of associate the LTC with. Yeah. But we do a ton more. Um, and everywhere from delivering the uh, uh, the technology, getting the technology delivered to uh, to a school, and then what to do with it once it's there. Um, the LTC is involved in all of that stuff, and. Um, Today, uh, we're going to take a look 
even higher level than that in how does the LTC help uh, uh, advocate and help schools access uh, the the programs and funding to actually get that those services to the school. And I know you've been you've been involved with this and and with our our uh, our guest today uh, a little longer than I have. Um, were you aware of all the things that that Mindy Fiscus, our director of uh, government affairs, does when you first started? So, you know, there, there's the, uh, that, that first layer of things that like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I get... But then when you, you start digging down into the weeds and into how funding, uh, go, uh, you know, how, how funding works and just understanding, um, you know, how to access the funding that's available, um, knowing the rules, knowing the deadlines, knowing the timelines, like that alone is enough to fill up. <laughs> my entire brain. Um, so it's yeah. amazing that she's able to, you know, uh, do all of those things plus a lot of others. And so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a ton of, of work that goes behind, goes on behind the scenes for helping schools to, you know, maximize the potential of funding that's out there, whether it be state or federal, um, to help close the digital divide, help close that gap up, help provide devices and, and most importantly, you know, connectivity, because without connectivity, the devices are, you know, Mm -hmm. not as powerful as they can be. So there's just so much that goes on. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really uh, having, having an advocate on our team that can help uh, navigate that is, is, I mean, it's priceless. So it's, and it's really fun to watch how, how much money rolls into the state, you know, through, through these federal programs and state programs. So, so schools can get the technology to help, teach students mm -hmm. and and it's it, it's important to point out mindy is a department of one you yeah. know she does it all and so i i guess we could we could talk about min we could sing mindy's praises all we want but it's probably best just to hear from mindy herself on some of the things that she is uh working on to help to help schools and educators serve students. So, so without further ado, let's meet Mindy Fiscus. Well, hi everyone. Today we'd like to welcome Mindy Fiscus to the podcast. Mindy, can you tell us a little bit about you and what you do for the LTC and for schools all around the state and, and even beyond? Okay, well, first, thank you for having me today, Matt. Um, so my name is Mindy Fiscus, and I am the Director of Government Affairs for the Learning Technology Center. And so I do a little bit of um, interesting work in my job. Um, I am the state E-rate coordinator, which is one of the federal programs that I manage. Um, I also do advocacy and any other kind of state and federal funding. Um, so I talk to legislators, I find out what's going on in Washington, D.C., uh, what's going on in Springfield, and try to advocate for the schools for anything ed tech, and then share that information out with others. Um, so my whole job is just to support schools in getting uh, funding for ed tech and knowing what to do with that funding once they get it. Awesome. Well, and, and if I remember correctly, you just um, got sort of a beyond state um, uh, award, okay. okay, so we'll talk about that. Um, yeah. I uh, represent the state of Illinois in CETA, which is the State Education Directors Association. So um, all of the states have a membership to CETA, and um, I'm the Illinois voting member. I also serve um, starting January 1st as their board chair. So I'm on their board, but I was awarded the State Leader of the Year Award um, in November. So I'm blessed to have that title as well. Well, and I bring that up because in education, we 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 don't always um, um, toot our own horns like we should, and and that's kind of an amazing achievement. So, well, thank congratulations, you. and and um, we're we're going to look for great things from you. No pressure. 
but today, uh, Mindy joined us to talk a little bit more about um, rulemaking and changes to national funding streams and, and the FCC in particular. So um, first off, what are some of the programs that the FCC manages and, and especially those that impact education? Okay, so um, it's kind of been a fun, um, fun time in the last uh, 12 to 24 months uh, for the FCC. Um, and that is where I spend a lot of my time. So the main program for education that the FCC manages is called E-Rate education rate is what it can't stands for and it gives a uh, it subsidizes the cost of internet access and network equipment for schools so everything to get internet to your school and then to disperse that internet uh, around the school um, so i mostly work with it directors but sometimes superintendents bookkeepers um, uh, business managers and school districts to apply for that federal program the FCC also manages and runs um, a healthcare program, a lifeline program that um, offsets the cost for those low income individuals. Um, then they've managed several of the stimulus funding sources. So one of those was called um, ECF, the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Um, another one was called ACP, the um, um, Affordable connectivity program. Um, so there's a lot of different programs that have stemmed from additional funding sources the last two to three years um, because of that. So everything gets kind of thrown at the FCC and they actually work with a partner, a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. called USAC, the Universal Service Administrative Company. And so the FCC makes the rules, which we're talking about today, and then USAC runs the programs for them. So there's like a division of power there um, that we typically see in government also happening over at the FCC. So lots of different things that they're juggling. They also get to deal with all of those interesting things like um, net neutrality and um, whether or not, you know, uh, companies that give us our Internet are are actually giving us what they're advertising to give us um, right. and any things, weird things every once in a while in their reports that are like um, people who've taken over the radio land waves and and like posted up their own radio channel and things like that and doing pirating yes. and things. So occasionally you see some things that they're dealing with when it comes to that as well. So all kinds of communications. Well, so first of all, you are amazing at the education and government alphabet soup. So, <laughs> I, will thank try, you. I will try to spell out what the acronyms mean, but there are a lot. <laughs> well, thank you for helping us uh, keep that straight and and figure out the 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 edu speak that we all uh, do. That's, and I'll, I'll that throw should be on my job description: translator of educational acronyms to English. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'll I'll throw a few banners up as you're as you're talking, but. But you, you mentioned the um, FCC and um, some of the uh, uh, educational programs and the rules associated with them. And these rules change from time to time. Um, how does that whole change process happen? So that's a great question. So it is definitely a process and there are checks and balances along the way. Um, in the last 12 months, like I've said, there have been a lot of um, proposed rule changes happening. Um, so a lot of them um, start with the FCC meets monthly. So there's an official monthly meeting, um, but each FCC commissioner is in essence an attorney who has a lot of attorneys that work for them. And um, they do research and get hearings and things from people all along. So you can schedule a meeting with an FCC commissioner, visit Washington, D.C., do a virtual meeting, anything like that, to talk about a topic. And when they start hearing rumblings or the same topics from several people, um, they start doing some work and some research on um, rules that should change or new programs and rules that should be started. So um, when they're interested in making a rule change, uh, the first thing that they do is issue what they call a notice for proposed rulemaking. So this is typically a document that says, hey, tell us what you think in legal language um, about this topic. And so they'll say, um, tell us what you think about this. And oh, by the way, here are the 20 questions that we're thinking about and would like your feedback on. 
Mm-hmm. That um, announcement is made typically in a written format and comes across, you know, several listservs across the state where people know that it's available. It doesn't technically get action until it's published in the Federal Register, which way back in the day used to be like a newspaper that had to be published. And then there was a really long timeline for people to find out about it and then reply. Yeah. And people replied back and forth in in writing. Um, or in phone calls that were transcribed. And today, um, it kind of speeds up the process a little bit because the National Federal Register is online. Um, So you can go on and see that. But once it gets posted in the register, there is at least 30 days required by law for them to receive comment. So they'll say, we're thinking about doing this thing. What do you think? Once it gets published, at least 30 days. Typically, we see 45 to 60 days for comment, but um, at least 30 days out, they'll say, we want your comments and answers to these questions by this date. So um, that date comes out. Once it's published in the register, you can count out that 30 or 45 days, whatever it lists, and you have what they call an initial comment period. Mm -hmm. So people will respond typically via their online system. So they have an online system where you can upload your comments in a written format and you can respond to those comments and they call that the initial comment period. Once that comment period is over, they publish everyone's comments. So you can go on and see your own comments. You can see other people's oh. comments. Um, and now then that's they have- an interesting reading from time to time. Yeah, yeah. And so sometimes- <laughs> In particular, in the state of Illinois, like we, um, if we make some comments from the LTC or whatever, we don't know what maybe the state network is commenting or what Mm -hmm. Chicago Public Schools might be commenting. And so sometimes we've entered a comment and then gone, oh, like, didn't know (laughs) that you're commenting that. Or maybe that a different state or a different association that we don't work with um, might be saying. So then they have what they call a reply comment period. So once they've published everyone's comments, you then get to comment on other people's comments. So many times states will sit back and not comment in the first round and kind of see what their associations have to say. So like ISTE, which is a National Teachers Association, might comment, or COSIN, which is a national um, uh, tech chief technology officer group, might comment, or even the um, various associations for teachers, unions, and things like that might Mm -hmm. have a comment on something. And then you can come in as a state or an individual or an individual school district in the reply comment period and say, I agree with what this and this person said, but I disagree with what this person said. So it's kind of like a public hearing, but it's all been done in writing. Mm -hmm. At at the same time, the other way to kind of have a voice and, and, and be involved is in like Zoom meetings or physical meetings. And mm-hmm. when you have a physical meeting or a Zoom meeting about a topic that's being discussed, that's being um, talked about, you have to file what's called an ex parte. So everything has to be on the record and public. So people will have a meeting and they'll discuss, you know, I really think it should go this way or that way. And then either the FCC, but typically the association or the person will upload just like they would comments an ex parte meeting, um, meeting notes, basically to say, this is what mm-hmm. we discussed and on the record, this is how we feel about it. And so that's the other way to comment. But um, that whole process typically takes a couple of months. So it's like, right. you know, 45 days or so for the first comment period, and then another at least 30 days or so for the second comment period. Um, And then they take all of those comments and they have a choice. They can either come out with new rules, a Mm -hmm. modified proposal, something that says we took into account what you've said, um, and this is what we're going to do, or they can choose not to act on it. So they can just let it be and say thank you for your input and never do anything. So Mm -hmm. Um, Many times when those reports come out, though, they will say, um, we heard from this person and this person and this, it literally lists in the citations, um, people's documentation. So it's very much like a legal document. And it says, you know, we've decided to go this route. And then underneath at the bottom, they'll say, you know, this was mentioned by these five comment places. So it's, it's quite a formalized process. Um, It happens for every rule change that they make. Um, so it's it's a lot, but typically um, we as schools only really get involved, or states at that fact, only really get involved when it's programs that we actively use and or will impact schools and libraries typically in our state. Mm-hmm. So 
anyone during this comment period, anyone, any, mm -hmm. anybody with a, an, a, a, a cell phone and a, internet yeah. access can, anyone can who's willing to comment. type it up and send something in, um, can put their comment out there. So it wow. could be, you know, a, a large school district like Chicago public schools, or it could be mm -hmm. your uncle Sam who just has a, an opinion about that today. So, um, right. Many times it's an association. Sure. Um, but yeah, anybody can have an opinion. And you might find in that first comment period dramatically different opinions. Mm -hmm. So schools may feel one way. Libraries may feel another. Local governments may feel a third way. Um, which is why it's kind of nice to have that second period to kind of come back and reflect and say, I liked this, this, and this from these three pieces and disagreed with this, this, and this. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a legal testimony. Yeah, well, and, and it makes sense. They're, they're giving anyone the opportunity to to ring in there and and to ring in on people who have rung in previously. That that's that's a nice public discourse. I like. Yeah, that. and on that note, sometimes the associations represent the providers. Since we're talking about oh, sure. IT stuff, you know, like the producers of the equipment, the offerers of the internet. Um, sometimes it's individual companies. So you might see a comment from somebody like an AT&T or a Verizon um, because mm -hmm. they do heavily work in this space that is managed by the FCC. So, yeah. Okay. So go ahead. I was just going to say, and their opinions are sometimes dramatically different than the well, users sure. that are, that are business getting interest, the right? service. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So we know kind of the process now. Mm -hmm. Um what what items are currently under discussion, at least, and I'm sure there's gobs of them, right. but in respect to education and schools in particular, um, you know, what should people know about, you know, what items should people know that are currently uh, under discussion right now? So um, about a year ago, they had mm -hmm. this um, proposed rulemaking comments on simplification of the E-rate program, um, in particular for tribal entities. So that would be any kind of school or library that is on a tribal fund, but also sure. kind of grouped in small schools and rural schools and libraries. Really? Um, saying what what ways might we make this process or this program easier? So lots of people um, went ahead and gave their comments on that. Um, when we were commenting, we said things like, you have too many submenus. Like maybe you should just have one category and, and deal with it. Why do we have to break it out by all these little subcategories? Like that seems ridiculous to me. Um, some people said things like, um, when a small library or a small school is applying for the funding, if, if, if it's less than $10,000 a year, they shouldn't have to bid out. They should just that should just be like a market available price and um, don't make us jump through all the hoops that the big schools have to jump through when it comes to that. Um, wow. Nothing ever came as a result of that. Like they took it in. Um, we have seen some small changes in the systems and the programs moving forward and may see some in the future that they gleaned from that. But no big like document was given out after that. Um, every year they have a proposed comment for what should be eligible for E-rate. And every year people comment and say, sure. you know, we want this, this, and this to be eligible. And um, they do come out then with a um, list of things eligible for E-rate every year. So that's something we see annually. Um, this year in particular, there's been a commenting period about a new proposed program for cybersecurity. So okay. um, they're proposing in the original document a three-year cybersecurity pilot. They said that it would be this much money. So they've given a dollar amount they want it to, to be. They've given a time frame they're thinking of doing it for. Um, and then they asked a whole bunch of questions. I think it's like a 150 page document of all of these questions saying things like what kind of services are other entities offering that school districts should be leveraging? Mm -hmm. um, who should be able to apply for this? Should this be like a competitive program? Um, what what do you think about, you know, structuring it this way or um, 
or doing you know the timeline, et cetera. And so uh, that comment period is currently open. The first round mm -hmm. of comments is due the end of January. And so in, for example, the Learning Technology Center staff, the IT staff and myself have sat down and talked and said, okay, three years is too long. We all need cybersecurity money now. So like we are recommending doing a shorter pilot rather than a longer yeah. pilot. Um, we looked at the amount of money that was in the in the available there and said and said, oh, okay, wait a second, it's going to cost way more than that, right? Like that might be enough for a pilot, um, but it overall there's going to be have to be way more money in the program um, to address cybersecurity. One of the things that we hear from school districts, so we'll be passing forward, is um, in E-rate only part of your firewall is eligible, which is a protection device that people put on their networks. Um, basic services is all that's eligible for E-rate. And so our IT staff was like, first and foremost, everybody needs their whole firewall paid for, the advanced or next generation services. Let's mm -hmm. get that paid for first. We're not recommending that that come out of the pilot fund. We're just recommending that you pay for that out of the program that exists and then right. use this money for a pilot. So, um, and again, uh, school districts and other entities might have a difference of opinion, but that's kind of what we're looking at here. The uh, again, then the original comment period for that is the end of January. And then the reply comment is 30 days later, the end of February. And then we'll see what they do with it. Um, mm. Maybe they'll roll out a pilot. Maybe it'll be a one year. Maybe it'll be a three year. Um, there is a big outcry right now for cybersecurity services for schools. And we see um, daily school districts Absolutely. being being attacked and being ransomware and everything. So it is important that we close that loop. And I think they recognize that. Uh, it does sound very much in their documentation like it's something that they want to do, but they're also very careful in the document to provide things like, are they the right people? Like, should this be national security? Should this be, oh. you know, secretaries of state's offices? Things like that. So it'll be interesting to see how that moves forward and what happens there. So that's the biggest one. Yeah. Um, the well, current, and timely because we're going to release this episode during uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So if you're listening yeah, to this that's right now. a big now, one to get fired up about right now, I guess. Um, yeah, and even right. if you're not ready or you don't feel equipped to do a um, comment, an original comment, then the reply comment is a great time to kind of go out and look at what everybody said and then say yes, you know, and and I think this, so does this group, this group, this group, and this group or yeah. these five states or something like that. So that's a nice way to kind of just give a and plus one um, thumbs Got up, it. I guess, yeah. <laughs> in the legal register. <laughs> uh, so that's the big one that everybody's talking about. And, and people get super excited when I'm out in this in the state talking to schools. And I'm like, OK, calm down. Just a proposed pilot <laughs> at this point. Right. <laughs> Nothing's official yet. They not said they're definitely mm. doing it. But um, there is a lot of interest there. Yeah. Gotcha. The, other one that's being talked about right now is the idea of using E-rate to support um, Wi-Fi hotspots that would be checked out and go home with students who would otherwise not have Wi-Fi at home. Okay. Um, it's something that the chairwoman of the FCC has been talking about for some time. She, she refers to that gap as the homework gap. And um, we did have some federal funding sources that did cover those costs for schools during mm -hmm. um, during the pandemic. Certainly and during so, the pandemic. We heard about that a lot. Didn't right. We? Right. And so as some of those funding sources are going away, um, she's saying, hey, does E-Rate or another program need to pick up the cost of what that would be? Um, is there a way for school districts to still provide some access at home for those students? And what would that look like? And that is a big change to the program because E-rate is, is strictly for internet access on school property. Uh, so it is for educational purposes on school property. Um, school districts aren't allowed to like broadcast their internet over to the local park next door or anything like that. Like it's right. very specific that it's school property. So that would be a change to the program itself um, to allow for that hotspot checkout. Um, mm -hmm. In the past, the program has covered things like telephone lines or um, uh, 
hot spots that would be for like a small school or something like that. But only the telephone lines went away um, in, in around 2000. So in the last modernization of the program and um, the um, hot spots kind of got diminished. So really they'll only pay mm. for those hot spots right now. If it is the cheaper of the options, cheapest option to getting oh. internet to a small school that has a handful of students. So mm -hmm. um, most of the time you see those on um, tribal lands or right. in small like regional offices of education that have an alternative program that maybe only has a handful of students, that might be the most cost effective option for that entity. So right. um, it is eligible, but limited at this point. So we'll see where that goes. Um, commenting period for that is open as well right now. Um, less less passion behind that one, let's say, mm. than, than the one that is um, cybersecurity because uh, mm. that would be a, a significant new program that the FCC yeah. Well, and if, you know, if, if, if you had to put all your eggs in one basket, uh, mm -hmm. that's a, that's a tough one. Yeah, Like that's both are one. important, um, yeah. but, and so we might see that as a future option, but it's not something that we can just say, Hey, that's going to be available. Um, because it does like change the program. Like I said, it, it sure. it's home access and it, it, everybody has to wrap their head around the concept that there's everywhere, anytime learning and that mm -hmm. learning doesn't just take place at school. Mm -hmm. And in order to be able to really take advantage of that, students need access at home and not all of them can afford it or have access to it. So. So during the pandemic, we heard about a lot of schools. Well, and even before the pandemic, a lot of schools were taking some some very unique uh, um, uh, actions to help provide that. Mm -hmm connectivity to students who who might not have had it mm -hmm. um you know we've heard of of um uh, a lot of school districts have put these wi-fi hotspots, for example on buses and during the pandemic they find places where you know park connectivity does. was limited but there were a lot of students around they go park the bus in the parking mm -hmm. lot or whatever and leave the hotspot on all night right um but um, uh, that that Wi-Fi on buses issue, um, I can see that being kind of sticky because technically buses are school property, mm -hmm. right? And if I yeah. put a hotspot there, so that's what's, interesting. What's going on with Wi-Fi on buses? Yeah, so that's interesting that you put it that way. Um, so, luckily for the program, mm -hmm. um, we already had uh, buses that were library units. So um, the program oh. for E-Rate supports both schools and libraries. And in many circumstances in rural communities, there is a library bus and not a physical building. And so that people can go to that um, library, portable library, and check out books, et cetera, at certain days it parked in certain um, parking lots. Typically, it's a yeah. um, community center parking lot or something that they, mm -hmm. they have that in. So using that as the precedent, um, the chairwoman said, I'm, we're going to expand the program and for this year, so um, we're now applying for next school year, the 24-25 school year, we're going to cover Wi-Fi on buses because that was something that was heavily used by those stimulus funding sources um, mm -hmm. like ECF. Um, and so those stimulus funding sources really kind of opened their eyes to how many people wanted Wi-Fi on buses and were using Wi-Fi on buses, not in particular to park them in a neighborhood, though that did happen, um, but in particular for those students who are on the buses for 30, 40, sometimes an hour, <laughs> 30, right. 40 minutes to an hour um, on the way to school and on the way home for school or ride those buses to after school curricular activities mm -hmm. just as another means to support their learning. Um, and be able to use those devices we've given everyone through the pandemic um, for virtual learning. And so mm -hmm. they made a, um, a proclamatory announcement that they were going to cover Wi-Fi on buses and cited those um, those library entities as an example of why they they felt like they could. To be fair, when the announcement was made, there were a couple of very vocal senators that came out and said, I think you're overstepping your bounds. Like, I, mm. I don't think this is eligible in the program, um, but overwhelmingly the support was there to meet students' needs, even as they, quote, extend the school day. So wow. that was a step in the right direction. Um, because that proclamation was made in a meeting 
and they didn't have a whole hearing process for it. It oh. just became part of the eligible services list. So this is something that we don't normally see happen that quickly, but it was, you know, allowable by the law, according to the chairwoman and the commissioners. So they voted yes on it. It became a part of the process and they really haven't even had time to update the forms to make it an eligible service. So there's a process. And if anybody is out there and interested in applying um, for the 24-25 school year, um, you have to file the open bidding form, which is the first form of the E-rate process. And there's a way to make it work, right? So we're kind of retrofitting uh, the form that's there. We're using that, those Wi-Fi hotspot applications, like I told you about before. Right. Um, we're using that as the element. We're putting in a document that spells out, you know, how many buses and what do you want and what does that mm -hmm. look like to kind of make the new rule work for the system. But again, um, according to the FCC, it's not a new rule. They didn't have to go through all of those rule change things. It's a new definition of the rule. Oh, a new okay. interpretation of the rule. And so by extending that interpretation, it's kind of a special thing that we don't see. Um, and it will, uh, because the buses are considered school property and because the mobile library units are considered library property, that that extends and gives us the right to do that. So that's been a special process. It is interesting. I've had a handful of districts who um, are interested in applying. They either already have Wi-Fi on their buses and they want that monthly service cost covered or they're mm -hmm. interested in doing it. Um, some who are even saying, hey, I want to put it on a couple of the buses and see how this goes and how we sure. can manage it and what it looks like. And then maybe in future years, apply for more. So um, sure. it's, it's an interesting thing. It's special, um, <laughs> as, we, as we like to say in the program. Um, but I think it's something that we will see. There's always this balance, though, Matt, between right. what they allow and how much money is available. Sure. So um, people get a little nervous when they start making proclamations and saying, we're going to make this eligible. Just like, though we'd all love to see cybersecurity eligible, maybe the pilot's the right way to go about it. Let's find out how much that's going to cost first. Mm -hmm. And is there a way that, you know, if we're going to increase um, the amount of money that's flowing out for cybersecurity, what might we do to increase the amount of money coming into the program to support it? Right. And that's all funded by taxes on your, you know, phone bills and things mm -hmm. like that. So um, there'll be, I'm sure there's some politics involved behind the scenes on the funding mechanisms as well. Well, sure, sure. Now, um, we understand that there may be some changes to a couple of laws that, that I'm sure educators have been uh, made very aware of recently, some changes to a couple of laws called COPPA and FERPA. Okay. Now, can you can you tell us about um, what those changes might be? Okay. So um, first, um, let's go ahead and start with COPPA because that's under the FCC purview. And since we're already talking about FCC, it is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And um, what it does is make rules um, for the providers who are giving the internet <laughs> um, on how to protect students online. So right now the rules say, um, and anybody under the age of 13, um, we, we check and see what can they see? Where, where are the filters? What kind of data are we tracking on those kids? Um, this has gotten really heightened awareness because it's uh, protecting these students on school property, right? Because you have students that are under 13 and then you have students that are right. over the age of 13. So some people have started saying with COPPA, um, maybe it needs to be increased to 17 or 18. Um, maybe we need to have one set of rules for those under 13 and one set of rules for those over, over 18. Um, the original rules that were put into play um, were put into play before social media even existed. And so it's a whole new world to address right. in, in the updating of this uh, legislation. So COPPA is under the FCC. Again, they'll go through the process that we talked about earlier about the proposed changes and say, these are some changes we think we should make. What do you think? And they'll move through that process. Um, the legislature will, I'm sure, have some um, opinions on it. And there are some bills and things that float around in the legislature um, that talk about, for one, for example, that happens to be sponsored a year ago um, by Senator Durbin from Illinois, was that um, he wanted everything to be deleted. So if a child turns 13, when they turn 13, any of their like 
tracking of the programs that they've used or any of the information that it was about them prior to the age of 13 should then be deleted and no mm -hmm. longer in the record. So social media presence, et cetera. And as we know, um, really, you're supposed to be 13 before you're on a social media right. platform. Um, but that was interesting because that would really impact school districts who use that data um, and the student information system data to track um, what kids are doing on those online programs and the, any kind of tests and assessments that they take. Oh. Um, because if you were forced to delete all that data, there goes all your longitudinal data about that student. So like, yeah. could we have an exception to that? What would that look like? Um, that bill really didn't move much, but may resurface. There's just a really big heightened awareness of protecting our students online and what that looks like, especially in the age of social media. So mm -hmm. um, they're looking to update those those rules and those guidelines because it's been some time, like I said. Um, well, and I would think that the ever growing presence of artificial intelligence would probably yes, have yes, that too. impact um, that and, as well. And, uh, and you know, um, just, I don't know how to say it, in a correct way, but like the validity of information online, right? So you've got sources mm -hmm. of information. You anybody can who's anybody can go online and post something today. That doesn't mean yeah. that it's accurate information. So how do we guide our students towards knowing what's accurate and what's not accurate is also mm -hmm. a part of that conversation. Sure. And 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 if we want to kind of crack down on that and say, you know, we're going to have people out there looking on the internet to check accuracy of things, how do we enforce that? What does that look like? <laughs> Are there fines that are going to be charged to, you know, websites or providers that that allow those kind of things to take place? And so it, there's a lot involved there. Uh, so that'll mm -hmm. it, those wheels will probably move slowly because there's a lot of people who have comments about it and opinions sure. about it. And sure. again, um, people get really passionate on opposite ends of the field there. So I'm we'll sure. see how that all moves forward. Um, it, related to that. We have a state law, and several states do. Ours is called SOPA or SOPA, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, and so in our state, any school district that uses a digital platform where a student might identify, have an identifier, so a login and password, even if they're logging in with their student um, email account, et cetera, behind the scenes, and they don't even click a login button, but it's done for them um, mm -hmm. in a single sign-on process, any um, anything that will be interacting with student data has to be tracked and has to be, have a note or a, a um, understanding or an agreement between the school district and the provider on where is that data being stored and what's being done with it. Even mm -hmm. if they're saying we're not keeping any data, like we have access to it, but we're not storing anything. It's just for a login that has to be stated in agreement. Um, right. The LTC actually has a um, partnership with a national national organization to kind of track and manage those agreements. And so there's a lot of piggybacking that goes on. So if like a Naperville school district signs an agreement with Google or somebody like that, um, once they've signed that agreement, if there's the writer on it, then any school district in Illinois can also cite and have the same or similar agreement. And that's kind of how that process has been working in Illinois. Um, it's gone really well, but it's also... Um, creating some some frustration or some anxiety with our tech directors who now find this on their plate right to manage sure. and keep track of and there's it's just an ever-changing environment so every teacher that goes out and clicks on some link after going to a conference or a training that's yet another agreement that you have to chase down and figure out and so um, i know it's been frustrating for some teachers that i know um, because they used to have the ability to just load whatever they wanted and use whatever they want and stay abreast of things and now mm -hmm. there's a process to go through to get those well, things approved um, and, but and let me let me let me clarify something that you said there this is only if they choose to use it with students and, and yes. collect student data. So right. it's so okay like to research them, but. Yeah. Yeah. So like a page where, where the teacher's just going and getting a lesson plan or the teacher's like but, showing a video, right. Up on in the interactive whiteboard in the front of the room would not be that imperative, but if you're going to send it out via Google classroom or canvas, or one of those other learning platforms, Schoology, et cetera, uh, and they're going to click on it themselves, well, now you're kind of getting into a gray area. And if right. somebody has to click on it and log in to see it, so it's going to like track your learning and you do this activity that's then followed by that activity, now you're definitely in that absolutely. student data tracking. So right. um, it's, 
it's a it's a slippery slope and most people tend to lean towards protecting yourself <laughs> and well, so that's what the law's for right um right and california so, has a law and new york has a law so so sometimes the laws are coming from the state um to enforce those things and then eventually a federal law will be there but in the united states any law that is happening in the state supersedes what's happening at the national level requirement mm -hmm. so um states tend to be first and foremost um the rule makers there yeah if if the federal government doesn't make a law about it the state governments can mm -hmm. right um so that's um that's your um copa uh the other one that you mentioned is ferpa um and so ferpa is um educational rights and privacy so that is um keeping track of um individual records and information of people similar mm -hmm. to like when it, there's another law for healthcare but when you go to the doctor and you sign all those papers that say yes my you know my kid can be the records can be looked at by these other doctors or the records can be looked at by these particular individuals have the right to bring my kid to the doctor or not or etc talk to you about the results it's similar to that um when it comes to schools and how they interact with student data and so um and that student data goes back and forth between schools in the state and sometimes mm -hmm. internet providers or or resources for signing on to track mm -hmm. their either their assessment scores or their use of those programs like we were talking about and that program is managed by the FTC the Federal Trade Commission and so when you look at the Federal Trade Commission they also have similar practices to the FCC um, but it's a whole nother entity. And that one is, in my opinion, more heavily um, um, addressed by the legislature. So mm -hmm. the Federal Trade Commission gets a lot of um, legislative inquiries, legislative support. That's also the company or the um, association that deals with the um, when companies buy other companies and whether they have, right. you know, <laughs> um, right. a monopoly and things like that. So mm -hmm. sometimes, and in this case, there may be some input that the FCC has, but in, in most, most of the cases, um, the Federal Trade Commission will be talking about data of students and um, data of, of uh, children in, in particular, it doesn't have to be a student in a school district. And what's being tracked and how that's being shared and what does that look like and what you're legally allowed to share or do. Um, and that's where FERPA comes in, right? Yeah, that that FERPA law, um, well, it has not been updated in, in several years as well. Right. And so, um, and now we have a lot of things to address. Again, social media, but also major changes that we've seen to healthcare and that we've seen to um, to banking online and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, people applying for loans and finances and things like that and how that's being impacted and just the identity of people and how we're going to protect those identities in particular um, right. student age children. Mm -hmm. So, Mindy, you have a ton of information uh, stored inside your head about all this stuff. Um if folks have questions about the things that we've discussed on this podcast episode today, um, we know that you're always willing to help people, but um, where else could people go to find answers about, about uh, uh, COPPA and FERPA and SAPA and the FCC and USAC and E-rate and all that stuff. Okay, so first, um, the FCC obviously um, has a website and I would recommend going there. Um, you do kind of have to navigate your way through it, um, but the FCC has a website. Um, typically a, a Google search about your topic will take you and direct you to that FCC website. And there's usually a landing page there. The other, um, and it's FCC.gov. Um, the other great resource for these kind of conversations is that USAC site. So that's the management company or the nonprofit, USAC.org. And um, that will take you to where all of those programs are being 
rolled out. So if you're interested in applying for E-Ray or one of these other programs, um, USAC is, is doing the application process. The FCC is making the rules. Um, the FTC has its own site as well. Um, there are multiple organizations, and I, I mentioned a couple of them earlier. ISTE is primarily for teachers and tech integrators, et cetera. Um, it's a national organization for teachers, and they have some resources where you can kind of check things out there. COSIN, which is our um, IT or our um, chief technology officers, um, that is uh, also a great resource to look at if you find yourself in that role. They do a lot of business manager stuff as well. And then the national organization that I'm a member of, CETA, um, S-E-T-B-A, State um, E-Rate or State Technology Directors, they, um, they try to kind of make one pagers. All three of those organizations are good about, and you've got all three levels there, right? Classroom, district, and then, um, of course, the state. And all three work together, sometimes even um, generating materials themselves um, in mm -hmm. partnership with each other. One pagers that kind of break it out and spell it out to your average school board member or um, superintendent to understand the process and what it goes through. Um, not every state has a state e coordinator who is as active as ours in our state, <laughs> um, really walk people through the process, et cetera. Um, we are lucky in that in that front to have um, not just myself, but yes, Eric Grocky at the State Board of, of Education, who are both really passionate about the program and um, really want to see that money come into the state of Illinois to support schools. Um, and so we we offer a lot of services and support at the LTC. Um, and again, our website is LTC Illinois spelled out dot org. Um, on that website, you can um, drill down to our services and see. Um, the support that we offer for the E-Ray process. Literally, we hold your hands. So if you're willing to attend a webinar, we're going to tell you what to click and how to get those forms in so that you can um, apply for E-Rate. Right now, that's the biggest one. Um, the E-Rate process is underway for this year. For So we're applying now for the next school year. And the deadline for those forms are um, the end of February and the end of March. So we're, we're looking, we're like hot and heavy right now with our, with our support for E-Rate. So if it's not something your school district is using um, and you would like to, definitely oh, reach out sooner rather than later to get signed up and move through the process. Yes. And it, it is a little process, but when you got somebody like Mindy to help guide you through it, um, right. it's, it's not as big and scary as you might think. Somebody, somebody to be the guide is the key because it can mm -hmm. get quite paperwork overwhelming. Um, if you don't have somebody sending you reminders saying now's the time to file this next thing. So, yes, um, but that's what we do. That's what we're here for. We like to say that's why the state pays us all the medium bucks. Right, Matt? <laughs> 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 Good point. Never big Good bucks, point. just medium bucks. Medium. There you go. Um, well, Mindy, thank you very much for spending a little bit of your time carving out, a, uh, carved out of your busy schedule um, uh, to tell us about some of the changes coming up and things to be aware of. You've given us some resources uh, to go uh, search out. And of course, um, if you go to uh, ltcillinois.org and uh, click on about us, I believe, or contact us, yeah. you'll be able to um, ask specific questions of Mindy um, if you need to. So um, Mindy, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me um, and getting letting me talk about all the things I love for, for an hour today. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks so much. And we'll talk to you again soon. Wow, Mindy does a ton of stuff for uh, for schools and and educators and and advocating for uh, uh, you know these programs that help our kids. Um, I'm just I'm incredibly impressed with how Mindy can uh, you know keep all those plates spinning and still Mindy goes around to uh, ROEs to support schools in E-rate training and things like that all year long, in addition to all of this, uh, all of this advocacy stuff. So, yeah, it, I, I don't, uh, I, I'm not jealous at all about the <laughs> amount of, uh, 
I'll just say jargon when it comes to, oh. you know, funding and working with the, you know, the, the federal level, like there's just so much that she is able to decipher and translate into normal speak, you know, uh, right. That you can understand because, you know, I, I've done this before. I've pulled, I've looked at grants. I've looked at different, um, different funding things and that you start reading through it and you're like, what are they asking for? What am I, mm -hmm. what's, what am I really supposed to be telling them in this portion of the grant or what? And, and to have somebody that's able to look at that and then tell the school, here's what they want to know. Here's what they mean. And here's what I recommend you put down to make sure you fulfill this. I, I think that that's fantastic. And just, you know, I think that there's, you know, the, the acronym piece and being able to even just keep up with what all of those different acronyms and, uh, things mean the and alphabet it, soup. Yes. is also a, uh, is also a pretty impressive feat. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. Um, I, I was, I don't know if you'd call it fortunate enough, but, uh, uh I, I was, um, uh, associated with the E-rate process, uh, before coming to the LTC and it can be, it, it has the potential to be a nightmare scenario, but Mindy's resources are, I mean, she makes it so simple now to, uh, by at least by comparison, it's all relative. Once again, by comparison, uh, she can help guide that process. And, and as Mindy said, folks, if you're not using E-rate, yes, it is a process but it's a process you can get through and Mindy's here to help you. And most many schools can get an extraordinary amount of uh, discounted or reimbursed services for their schools through E-rate. Um, and by the way, I am compiling a list of all of the definitions of the acronyms that Mindy uses in the interview. And you'll see that uh, linked in the uh, show notes for this episode, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your favorite uh, podcatcher um, device. So um, again, Mindy, Mindy's amazing. Um, the That concept of, of buses and and having hot spots on buses mm -hmm. i first heard about that long before i came to ltc there were um some school districts a lot of them up in the suburbs that the chicago suburbs that were providing and i i allude to it when i was talking to um mindy um a lot of school districts were leveraging those hotspots in innovative ways on buses to help kids get their homework done, to help kids who don't have access at home and things like that. And those were some excellent uh, examples that a lot of schools downstate and I think around the nation really um, grabbed onto and adopted during uh, you know, our emergency e-learning days uh, during COVID and, and since. So it, it's, it's kind of amazing the reach that little ideas can have. Well, and I think it just goes to show that educators, no matter whether they are the teachers in the classroom, the, you know, tech staff that's responsible for making all the technology work, the administrators, there's the educators in general, always find ways to make things work. Right. Uh, you know, they always find a way like whether it's, you know, an unfunded mandate or um, a, a new, new set of standards, they, they, they roll up their sleeves and find a way to say, okay, here's what we have. How do we make this work? And I, and I think it just goes to show the, the, um, you know, an ingenuity and the, the, the willingness to try new things that educators have always had. This is I mean, before technology, but, but even more so now. So I, I think that it's great. And, um, you know, you, you think about how exciting it is for, a, for, for a one-to-one, -one, uh, learning environment, but, you know, as you were just alluding to, 
with there's not that connectivity at home. I mean, I, I can speak for myself, my, where my parents live in West central Illinois, they've got fiber within a half ish mile of their house in two directions and it, they're not coming down anytime soon to, to connect them. And, you know, you think about, and believe me, when I'm on their Wi-Fi, I know I'm on their Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> you know, and so you think about how many other people have poor connection or no connection at home. And and if you you enter the world of one-to-one -one environment and all the wonderful ways that technology can transform the way students learn, but if they leave and go home and don't have that access, you know, that, that creates an equity issue. And so I love the idea of, of finding ways to get that access and get that connectivity to all the students so that equity is not mm -hmm. you know it hopefully someday becomes zero issue uh, and many of us take that connectivity for granted because it is you know um um i think the word is omnipresent in many places you know no matter where you go there's a in in many places there's always a wi-fi signal or cellular connection but i think one of the things that's important to note is that there are spots, fortunately fewer all the time, but there are spots where it's hard to even get a cellular data connection, yeah. mm -hmm. um, even to access this. And, and we're not even talking about being able to afford it. We're talking about simple access. And when, when Mindy talks about, you know, the, the, the library buses that come to town and, yeah. and that's the only, that's not just the only access that some communities in Illinois have to not just Wi-Fi, but books. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it just, it, it is heart wrenching. And I think, once again, everything's relative. I think it's important that we think about those communities where that abstract concept for many is their daily reality. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think that that really hit home for me uh, during during the interview. I agree. Uh, the The other thing that hit home is we focus on teachers and schools primarily mm -hmm. in the work that we do. Mindy's, uh, Mindy's point of view is much broader because USAC, Universal Services Administration, blah, 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 and E-Rate um, serve public libraries. Mm -hmm. when, she, when she's talking about libraries, she's talking about public municipal libraries that she helps serve. Mm -hmm. So Mindy's reach is, is extremely broad. And yeah. again, uh, uh, just a wealth of knowledge that, that she brings to the table. So Brian, um, this has been a heck of an, uh, of an episode. Um, yeah. We are going to be coming back uh, in another month uh, with another episode uh, this episode is going to be published during Cybersecurity Awareness Week here in Illinois. Um, so uh, please head over to ltcillinois.org. Check out all of our uh, resources. Um, follow us on the social media and whatnot. And um, check out the uh, uh, Meet Our Staff page and uh, get in touch with people like Mindy who can, who can help you, your schools, and your communities uh, with all of their learning, many of their learning needs. So thanks everyone for joining yep. us. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the LTC One to One Podcast. You can find and subscribe to this video podcast on YouTube or listen to the audio by subscribing on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast was produced by the Learning Technology Center of Illinois, a program of the Illinois State Board of Education. 
Learn more about the LTC at ltcillinois.org.